May all my days bring glory to your name. Man, well, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm excited to be here before you and get to bring the study and worship in the Word. Um, my name is Frank Klein. Uh, you know, most of you know me. But uh, this morning, we're going to be continuing in our series, Developing a Disciple's Mindset, uh, our study through the book of Philippians. And last week, uh, we kind of took a break. It was Easter. David spoke uh, on the gift of Christ. We were looking at John 3.16. And we're going to be jumping off of that a lot this morning. But uh, first, I want to know, how many of you have ever been to a lighthouse? Okay, quite a few. Well, we're, we're a little closer to lighthouses now than we were in the mountains. But uh, when I was in the eighth grade, we had spent the year studying uh, North Carolina history, and when we got the chance to go to the Outer Banks on uh, a coast trip, and for me, that was a big deal. I mean, as a mountain kid, I've always loved heights. I've always loved tall mountain views, uh, but out here, you don't really have tall mountains. Uh, you know, you can't really get those vantage points. So when I found out that we were going to get to climb the stairs to the top of the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse, I was really excited. I mean, this is the nation's tallest lighthouse. But what really fascinated fascinated me as we got to explore this and check this out was the experience and the role of the lighthouse keeper. You know, historically, lighthouse keepers were needed to trim wicks. Uh, They would replenish fuel and lamps. They had to wind clockworks. They had to perform maintenance uh, on the lamps, on the windows, on the lenses. They were responsible for for taking care of fog signals. They were responsible sometimes even for keeping up weather stations and in the event of something happened to ships at sea, they might even be involved in search and rescue. So, I mean, these, these guys had, they had a lot on their plates. But they had to do all of these things in rotations and regardless of what the weather was like. And you know what? That meant everything to the sailors out on those ships. But before the invention of electricity, these lighthouse keepers, they'd have to fulfill a lot of different tasks. And when it came to refilling the oil and the lamps in these lighthouses, some of them would have to carry these buckets of hot lard or oil all the way up to the top as often as every two hours to keep these things running. So who wants to take a guess at how many steps are in the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse? Actually, pretty close. 257 stairs. So you think these guys were in shape? So this morning, we're going to be looking at Philippians 2, verses 12 through 18. And in this passage, we really get to see the opportunity that we have as disciples to be like light bearers, lighthouse keepers, who shine light and give hope in a world where people need that light and hope. And where they need the hope and light of Christ. So, that's where we'll be this morning. Uh, If you will, please go ahead and stand with me in honor as we read God's word. Verse 12 starts like this. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith. I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you just for the opportunity uh, for us to gather here this morning to study your word um, and to worship together. I pray that this time would be uh, a blessing I pray, Father, that uh, the Holy Spirit would have freedom to work in our lives and reveal to us, Father, uh, what you're desiring for us to see. 
And I pray, Father, that you would mold us and change us and transform us into these light bearers that you're desiring us to be. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. So, verse 15 really gets to the heart of this passage when Paul talks about shining as lights in the world. But as we explore the life of light bearers and what God is desiring us to learn, we want to remember where have we been in this study. So, verse 12 starts with, Therefore, my beloved. And anytime we see the word therefore, we really want to ask, what's the therefore? Therefore. So when we look back at the context of this passage, we're reminded of the source of light bearers. And that's Jesus Christ. Because to be a light bearer, you must have a source of light. Otherwise, you're not going to have any light to bear. So really, the last two weeks, we've been exploring this. We've been exploring the source of light bearers. And David helped us to see what it meant that Christ came to the earth as a man to love and serve us. And to show us what it looked like to humbly love and serve others. He helped us see how disciples followed Jesus' model. And they let Christ's mind guide them in the way that they live. We explored how Christ made himself of no reputation. And how he took the form of a bondservant which meant that he willingly chose to submit to what God was desiring, even to the point of death. And a couple weeks ago, we studied the beginning of chapter 2, and that's where David helped us see how Paul was wanting the Philippians to fulfill his joy by being like-minded, by letting nothing be done selfishly but to put others above themselves. And that's what Christ did. He was our source of light. He was the perfect example of this. So we don't want to forget that Paul's continuing a train of thought here in chapter 2. And we want to remember that unity has been a huge theme. But Paul is encouraging them here in verse 12 what it looks like to live with Christ's mindset as followers of Jesus. To be his disciples. So Paul says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. So here, Paul's, Paul's really trying to persuade them. He's trying to help them see, hey, you've done well. You've always obeyed. You've sought to be disciples of Jesus when I'm with you. So keep going. Don't, don't stop just because I can't be there with you. Just because I'm imprisoned and just because I'm having to suffer, don't let that stop living as disciples of Jesus. He's encouraging them and he's trying to persuade them to keep living it out now that he's no longer with them. But the question is, how, how do they do that? How do they live as light bearers? So Paul says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And I don't know about y'all, but when I read that, I'm like, okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, what, what's he talking about here? That sounds pretty intense. But as we look at the life of the light bearer, we really find that this is the guiding process for a light bearer to live this out. And the idea is this. So last week we looked at the gift of Christ. And we talked about how salvation is free and how all you have to do to be saved is accept the free gift that God's given through Jesus Christ. That there's no strings attached so when we read this passage here, we're, not, we're understanding that Paul isn't encouraging the Philippians to work for or even to prove their salvation. Instead, he's encouraging them to the respond to the gift that they've already received by believing. He's inviting them to join a process to be light bearers. So the words work out, they're a translation of this Greek word, which means to carry out the goal or to carry to its ultimate conclusion. And it's this picture of accepting the light and then allowing that light to shine through you. So Paul's encouraging them here to carry their salvation, their light, to its conclusion, which is Christ-likeness. 
He's saying, allow the light to permeate your life and to change the way that you live. Now, we have this term, um, and it's called sanctification. And that's exactly what it's talking about here. The process of sanctification. It's a process of God setting us apart and molding us into what he is desiring us to be. It's a process of learning to live with the victory over sin that we've received through Christ so that we can live in a way that's pleasing to the Lord day in and day out. And, that, and this is exactly what it means to grow to spiritual maturity. It's this picture of unwrapping the gift of salvation in your life and learning how that gift impacts the way that we think, the way that we view ourselves, the way that we view others. And it's joining this process that leads to growth in the Christian life. It's a picture of learning to and becoming all that God desires you to be. So I was talking to someone about this process this week, and they brought up a really neat illustration. See, choosing not to join this process is like being given an iPhone and saying, Oh, wow. Thank you so much. This, this iPhone is beautiful. You know what? I'm going to take it and I'm going to carry it with me everywhere that I go. And then walking through life with this iPhone in your pocket and never turning it on. You know, never learning to use it, never knowing how it works. I mean, you have it. You've got the phone. You're carrying it with you. But you're missing out on all that you can do with it if you don't learn how to use it. And how to live with it. So we would obviously say, you know, to do that with your smartphone would be silly. Especially as much as, you know, they costed. <laughs> but it's really easy for us to look at our salvation as a get into heaven pass. And a get out of hell free card. And then never experience the depth of light and life and relationship that God is desiring us to have through it. So when it comes to the fear and trembling part, we aren't talking about this like slavish terror because of the wrath of God. That's not the idea that's here at all. Instead, we're talking about this idea of a wholesome caution. It, it's, it's a process that's meant to be taken very seriously. It's this idea of being vigilant against temptation. Just like a lighthouse keeper is vigilant to do whatever it takes to shine light as best as they can, whether it be through trimming wicks or through cleaning the lenses on the lamps uh, or through repairing the windows on the lighthouse, you know, even in terrible conditions, it's taken very seriously. And there's an intentionality to be proactive to shine that light. And Paul's continuing in verse 13 to help the Philippians see all that comes as they commit to this process of being light bearers. So, he says, let's see, there we go. He says, it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So Paul's wanting us to see that God takes great pleasure in empowering us when we commit to being light bearers. And when we commit to allowing God to sanctify us. So we see that light bearers are empowered by God. And the idea behind light bearers being empowered by God is that God working in you, he, he's, he's energizing you. He's, he's empowering you to live out your salvation. See, when you believe in the gospel, when you believe in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection and you accept that free gift, then you receive the Holy Spirit. And it's His Holy Spirit who will energize you and enable you both to desire and to do the things that God is pleased with. But there's this big question with this, and that's that, are, are we wanting that? Because it all starts with the working out. We must first choose to be a part of this process. And the problem comes when we decide that we want to go our own way. Because God doesn't energize us or enable us to please Him when that's not something that we're wanting. 
So maybe you've, you've had this mindset or you've heard someone who had this. They kind of ask God to give them the, the desire to stop some sort of sin. But while they were asking that, they were still choosing to do it. And when that happens, you know, how, how does that work out? Because the reality is God's never going to force on us a desire for him that we are actively fighting against. Even when we have the Holy Spirit. We first must say no to going our own way if we're going to go his way. Because it's, it, it's not possible for us to go his way while also going against his way. Those things, they don't work together. So if we're choosing sin and we're waiting for the desire to go his way to come before stopping that sin, then it's just not going to happen. So when he's talking about this process, we're talking about committing to working out our salvation and God empowering us for it. And he does that each and every time. See, when he reveals another area to give to him, then as disciples of Jesus, we want to say yes. And we don't have to muster up the strength to do everything perfectly because the reality is that we're going to fall short. But instead, we want to have this attitude that says yes whenever God reveals an area that he's desiring to grow us in and change us in. And that's an offer that's there every day, day in and day out. So as we're studying Philippians chapter 2, I want to know something. Are you starting to see a theme? I mean, Paul just keeps telling them. He's saying, let this mind be in you. Let your conduct be worthy of the gospel. Let nothing be done out of selfish ambition. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Let, 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 let. He keeps, he keeps showing us that there's this choice. And Paul's urging them to choose the process of being disciples of Jesus and choosing this process of sanctification. So if the answer to whether we're committed to this process of discipleship is yes, then we can trust that God's going to empower us to be his disciples. And he's going to do that because right here at the end of this verse, it's his good pleasure to do that. So if we want to be light bearers, then he will shine through us and he will enable us to shine light because he's the source of that light. He's the God of light and life. It's it's who he is. So he's continuing to encourage them and what it looks like to be light bearers. And he says in verse 14, do all things without complaining and disputing. And this idea of complaining and disputing, it's not so much about complaining like, you know, when you're a little cold or when your food isn't hot. Instead, it's this idea of murmurings or gathering secretly to talk bad about someone and complain about them. It's this picture of when someone doesn't like the way that another person does something. So instead of just going and, and, you know, talking about it with them and like seeing if you can work things out and seeing if you can come to like a solution in the situation, going and voicing, you know, I really don't like how this person's doing this. And I really think that it could look a whole lot better. So Paul starts here because it's this type of complaining and it's this type of murmuring that builds and builds and leads to disputing. But what's interesting is that he tells them to do all things without complaining and disputing. So, we might get a little real here. But have you ever had these moments where you get upset and you aren't happy with someone and you, and you start by just thinking, man, I really didn't like that. I really didn't like what they did. So you start grumbling and you start complaining. And it might just start with you and then you might hear somebody else talk about it. Maybe they're upset at a, work, at a boss at work, or they're upset at a teacher, or maybe it's a sibling upset at their parents. And you decide, you know what? We're thinking the same thing. You're right. We don't like how they're doing that. And next thing you know, there's fighting, and there's arguing, and there's turmoil. 
And, and this, is the, this is the complaining and disputing that we're talking about here. And this is what Paul's saying. Hey, we got to do without this. But why? For one, it impacts our ability to grow to maturity, which is the goal of working out our salvation. And we've already talked about this a little bit, but, but Paul's trying to help them see that what comes with committing to this process of being light bearers and doing all things without complaining and disputing is that you're sanctified by God. So Paul's wanting them to see that by doing without this, they will be sanctified, that they will become blameless and harmless. And again, this isn't a picture of perfection, but it's this picture of growing to spiritual maturity, of growing into what God is desiring you to be. And the problem with this complaining is that there's, there's an issue at the heart, and it's discontentment. It's what comes when what you want to happen doesn't happen. So you begin complaining because you aren't getting what you want. And then it quickly becomes something where you're trying to find ways to get what you want. Sometimes, no matter what it takes and no matter who it impacts and affects. What happens when our focus is on what God wants in a situation instead? Because if our chief focus throughout our days is that things be as God desires, then we won't find the need to complain so that the situation fits what we want. So choosing to have this focus actually protects us from our own selfishness. It helps us to let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. It helps us to esteem others better than ourselves. It helps us to look out for the interests of others instead of our own. And that's what Paul began the chapter pointing the Philippians to. And he's building to this concept of what living this way enables them to be and to do. To be light bearers. To be light bearers who shine as lights in a desperate world. So I'm going to bring this slide back up. But Paul says that you may become blameless and harmless. Children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Among whom you shine as lights in the world. Holding fast the word of life. See, when we get caught up in this trap of complaining and disputing, then it directly impacts our ability to shine as lights in this world. And our complaining and our disputing actually becomes something that the world looks at and holds us at fault for. It becomes something that we're known for. So I want you to think for a moment about some of the complaining that you might have found yourself in. Or, or maybe some other Christians in. Were those complaints always with other Christians? You know, sometimes we're complaining and we're disputing with those of the world. And I, and I want us to think like, how reasonable is this? This passage is telling us that the world's spiritual condition is morally crooked, spiritually perverse. In other words, they don't have the Holy Spirit. So all they know is self-centeredness. And all they know is moral crookedness. And they don't know how to think spiritually. So their thinking is twisted and distorted from what is good. And sometimes we go through life and it's almost as if we expect that someone without the Holy Spirit and without the mind of Christ is going to be loving and living in a way that's showing me God's love. So then when they don't, we're like, why am I getting mistreated? See, the people that we work with, the people that we rub shoulders with, even our own family sometimes, or the people that maybe serve us at a restaurant, we get frustrated and we completely forget their condition. And we completely forget that they may not have Christ, that they may not have the Holy Spirit. And then we start this murmuring and we start becoming discontent because we, aren't, we don't like the way that they're treating us. And then we start having this inner dialogue and this conversation and we're convincing ourselves that our way's best 
I can't believe he did this. And I can't believe that he did or that she said this. And it just keeps building and it builds and it builds. And it builds to the point that we end up teaching it to our children. And we start influencing others to do the same thing. And then the next thing we know, this characterizes our life. And it becomes something that the world holds against us and blames us for. And if you take a step back, especially in our culture, is this not the way that the world views the church in the United States? I mean, sometimes people either leave churches because nobody can get along, or they don't want to be a part of them because what they see is how the Christians backbite and complain against each other. And that's if they aren't the victims of it. So the question is, Will we show something different? Because God's desiring for us to be his light bearers in a dark and desperate world. Just like those lighthouse keepers. Just like they are in their lighthouses for the sailors who are in the dark. Who are out there in stormy nights. So the idea here of holding fast the word of life... It's simply one of shining the light of salvation before others, for all to see. It's a picture of letting your life be a display that others can see that points to God's life. So the question for us personally becomes, am I shining in a way that points them to the hope of Christ? Does the perspective that I have point people to God? Do they see the mind of Christ in display through me? Do they see his light being lived out in front of them through my life? Do they see the forgiveness of Christ through the way that I am forgiving others? Do they see the love of Christ through the way that I'm loving and interacting with others in my life? Do they see his service and the way that he served us through the way that we are serving others? And are they, are they seeing his humility through the way that we are humbly living day in and day out? Or instead, do, they, do I let and do we let our complaining and our selfish ambitions be the chief thing that they see? So what would it take for those who desperately need Christ to see our lives and and like these sailors in the sea, to see the lighthouse? To see the hope and the joy and the love in our lives and to say, man, I need what they've got because it's my only hope. Several weeks ago, Rance Schuler, who's one of the pastors at Robbinsville First Baptist, he came and, and he spoke, but... A while back, he spoke on this passage, and he said this. God's light wants to shine through your life in such a way that other people would see that they need Jesus. That that person has joy, and I'm joyless. That that person has hope, and I'm hopeless. So don't let the wine stop the shine. And that's really what Paul is saying here. Don't let the wine stop the shine. So he closes this idea by saying that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I've not run in vain or labored in vain. And what Paul's meaning by this is that by the Philippians being faithful light bearers, Paul will have an abundance of examples to take great joy in when Christ returns because they were faithful to Christ and they were faithful to the process of being light bearers. And he can rejoice that all his labor wasn't in vain. In other words, it didn't result in people being led to darkness, but instead it led to the hope of Jesus and his light being spread to others throughout the world. And this really sets up what we get to see as the mindset of a man who shows us what light bearing looks like lived out. We really get to see what this mindset and what this process looked like through Paul's life. So he says, Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad 
and rejoice with you all. So no matter what happens, no matter what the Philippians choose, Paul's saying that he's content with his life being poured out as a simple drink offering. And if you don't know, a drink offering, it it was an offering where they took some sort of liquid, you know, generally a wine, and it was poured out onto a main offering. And as that offering was burning, that drink offering simply burned up. It turned to vapor and smoke. And what Paul's talking about here is the possibility of his own death. And he's talking about his own life in death being like this picture. He's not focused on being the main show or the main sacrifice to God, but instead he's hoping that he will be the lesser part of the sacrifice poured out onto the main sacrifice. Isn't this completely countercultural to the way that our world thinks? I mean, it's, it's completely opposed to what's natural to us. He's saying that even if they choose not to live as light bearers, then his own life lived out bearing light is enough. That even if it means his death, living as a light bearer was worth it. Even if no one responds and joins him, he's going to be glad and rejoice. Because even if he's the only one who chooses to live it out, the light shined. Now the world, they would consider this a complete waste of time. It's completely vain. But Paul's saying, hey guys, this is it. This is the life of light bearing that we're being invited to. Just like the Philippians. See, our lives can be the same sort of sacrifice and service to God. And that's why Paul finishes in verse 18 and he says, For the same reason... With the same motivation, you also be glad and rejoice with me. Paul's wanting the Philippians to share with him in this process. He wants them to see the beauty and the worth of living as light bearers. Because if you remember, they had written this letter to him, or a letter to him. They'd sent... Epaphroditus to come and to tell them and to check on how he's doing. Because they're concerned. Because Paul's imprisoned. He's facing possible death. And they're worried about him. They care about him. And yet all the while, all this stuff's going on in Paul's life. And his focus is on staying faithful to the process of being a light bearer. And on living with the mind of Christ. And he's wanting to point them to the same joy also that he has. So Paul helps us to see that at the end of the day, a light bearer gets to rejoice. Because whatever happens, they get to love and serve God and be a part of his plans. And they get to take the opportunity to be a humble drink offering poured out. Is that enough for you? I mean, this is such a small and simple picture, yet it's what motivated Paul to be the light bearer that he was. So at the end of the day, a lighthouse keeper goes through a whole lot to be a part of this process of bearing light for all the sailors to see. In the darkest of nights, through clear nights and easy seas, or through foggy nights and stormy seas, the lighthouse keeper has the gift of being used to bring the sailor light and great hope. So may we let the hope and light of Christ motivate us to be a part of the sanctification process and to work out the salvation that he has given us so that we may develop a disciple's mindset. May we take comfort in the fact that God will empower us And he will sanctify us and he will use us for his glory as we commit to the process of living as disciples of Jesus. And may a sacrificial life of light bearing be what motivates us day in and day out to live with joy before a world that desperately needs it.
Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the gift that you have sent us through your son, Jesus Christ. That we have been justified through faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of your son, Jesus. So I pray, Father, that we will be a people who work out our salvation. Who take it serious, Father. And that the way that we interact with others would shine light and would shine the hope and light of Christ to their life. Father, so they can have it too. Continue to mold us into the people and the creations that you desire us to be. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the worship team will come lead us in song as we close. If you'd like, you can go ahead and stand. And thank you all for the opportunity to speak. us out today. Uh, let us share that with others. We love you and we know that you love us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.